On the Ides of March in 44 BC, Julius Caesar was stabbed 23 times. Brutus was one of the main conspirators. Ever since, the name Brutus has become synonymous with treason. In Dante's Inferno, all the way in the center of hell, Lucifer resides, frozen in ice. A frightening monster guilty of the most terrible sin of all, betrayal. The entire ninth circle of hell is reserved for those who betrayed their benefactors. Lucifer is the worst, as he betrayed God himself. But in Dante's depiction, Lucifer has three pairs of fangs. One of those mouths is eternally chewing another famous traitor, Judas. In the final mouth, Brutus. That Dante would place Brutus alongside Judas as one of the worst people in history, literally close to Satan, is testament to how Brutus was seen in popular conscience even a millennium after his death. Some 300 years after Dante, Brutus played yet another role in a famous literary work, this time not in a poem, but in a tragedy, Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare. Brutus, in this play, is treated very differently. In fact, the play ends with Mark Antony paying tribute to Brutus by calling him the noblest Roman of them all. And in an interesting paragraph in The Joyful Science, Friedrich Nietzsche agrees with Mark Antony's assessment. It is to Brutus that Shakespeare consecrated his best tragedy. Shakespeare believed in Brutus and cast not a shadow of suspicion on the kind of virtue which Brutus represents. Why do Shakespeare and Nietzsche speak so lovingly of the traitor Brutus? What is this virtue of Brutus that Nietzsche refers to? Let's take a closer look. By the way, if this combination of Nietzsche and Shakespeare interests you, we've done a deep dive on Nietzsche's interpretation of Hamlet as well. Check out the link in the description. We also plan to cover more of this in the future, so please subscribe if you don't want to miss these videos. For Nietzsche, Brutus epitomizes the uncompromising aristocratic search for total freedom and independence. When Brutus killed Caesar, he did so because Caesar threatened his freedom of soul. That Brutus was able to do this, to sacrifice Caesar on the altar of his own freedom, so to speak, elevates him to the status of greatness. Independence of soul, that is the question at issue. No sacrifice can be too great there. One must be able to sacrifice to it even one's dearest friend. Note that Nietzsche's interpretation of the motive of Brutus is different from the motive expressed in the play. At the end of the play, Mark Antony praises Brutus for his nobility of action. While the other conspirators killed Caesar for their own selfish ends, Brutus was the only one who did what he did because he believed he would serve the good of Rome. In other words, Brutus had pure intentions. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in a general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. Brutus wanted to prevent a dictatorship in Rome. He saw himself as a liberator who would save the Roman Republic by killing the power-hungry Caesar. He did so with great sadness, at least if you can take his own words at face value. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. So when we look at the text of the play, we see Brutus as being concerned with the welfare and freedom of Rome. But in Nietzsche's interpretation, this supposed care for the well-being of Rome is simply a shorthand for Brutus to express the fear of his own loss of freedom. By liberating Rome, he liberates himself. That's what he is all about, despite his lofty words for the Roman Republic. The true kernel of the tragedy, the main driver of the plot, is this dilemma of Brutus. Kill his friend and keep his freedom, or spare him and lose his independence. He chose the former, and that's what Nietzsche admired about the character, and also what Nietzsche admired about Shakespeare, for having Brutus make this choice while also not being chastised for it. Nietzsche puts on his psychologist's hat and speculates that Shakespeare, as the writer of this tragedy, must have been in a similar tough spot in his own private life and used the character of Brutus to give symbolic expression to this dark hour. Do we perhaps stand before some somber event or adventure of the poet's own soul, which has remained unknown and of which he only cared to speak symbolically? What is all Hamlet's melancholy in comparison with the melancholy of Brutus? And perhaps Shakespeare also knew this, 
as he knew the other by experience. Perhaps he also had his dark hour and his bad angel, just as Brutus had them. So interestingly, the play Julius Caesar is for Nietzsche not a political play, but a psychological one. The main theme of the tragedy is the tortuous position Brutus finds himself in. Should he choose the freedom of his soul over the life of his friend? This is the true tragedy of the play. It's decidedly not about whether or not monarchy is preferable to a republic or other such political questions, at least not primarily. The play is about Brutus and the internal battle he wages with his conscience on what he should do. In that respect, he is very much like Hamlet. By the way, Nietzsche says that the play is actually named after the wrong person. The true object of the drama is Brutus, not Caesar. Caesar dies about halfway through the play. That Brutus is actually the protagonist of the play has been a staple of interpretation and criticism, and Nietzsche firmly roots himself in this tradition. But then, what about Caesar? It's no secret that Nietzsche speaks admiringly of Julius Caesar throughout his writings. In discussions on the Übermensch, and whether or not there have been historical examples of such Nietzschean supermen, Caesar is often brought up as someone who would at least come close to that ideal. And in the passage we're discussing in this video, Nietzsche also praises Caesar. The grandest of men, the ornament of the world, the genius without peer. Some commentators have been puzzled by Nietzsche's praise for both men. How could Nietzsche praise both Caesar and Brutus, his traitor and murderer, does praise for one not imply condemnation for the other? But this contradiction only occurs if you look at the play at face value, when we assume that the play is about politics. The play is about the importance of having an independent soul, a free conscience, and the willingness to do anything and everything to keep this freedom. And yes, that does include the murder of a friend, even if, and especially if, that friend happens to be a genius without peer, the grandest of men, the noble Caesar himself. Brutus attains greatness precisely because Caesar did not deserve to die. The elevation in which Shakespeare places Caesar is the most exquisite honor he could confer upon Brutus. It is thus only that he lifts into vastness the inner problem of his hero, and similarly the strength of soul which could cut this knot. Brutus will not relinquish his independence of soul and freedom of conscience for anything or anyone, he places his own individuality above the concerns of politics, morality, and even friendship. Brutus attains the highest Nietzschean ideal in the relentless pursuit of his own autonomy. Brutus, in this respect, truly acts beyond good and evil. Thank you for watching, and thank you to our patrons who support the channel. If you like the work we do here, feel free to take a look at our Patreon page. By supporting us there, you'll also have access to extra exclusive content. For more Nietzsche, you can watch our video on Hamlet, or if you want a deep dive in the entire book of the Joyful Science, check out our big analysis. Again, thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.